Good morning, CLC. And now, in this moment, I invite each and every one of you to take a nice, deep, cleansing breath in. Breathe in the cool, calming life that is fresh from this morning. And as you release the breath, release all that no longer serves you. Allow everything that you no longer need to just wash away from your body. Wash away from your mind. Allow yourself to be open to new possibilities, new thoughts and feelings. This new spring day. And if you feel so inclined, go ahead and take another nice, deep, cleansing breath in. Breathing in love and light and life. And as you release this breath, allow your body to just relax in this moment. And allow your mind to be here now. Universal love enfolds me. Universal wisdom inspires me. Universal spirit enlightens me. Universal power encircles me. I am one and all is well. As we begin this inner healing process, let me invite you to relax in this quiet moment, opening yourself up to the miracle working higher power. Now symbolize the unity of your thinking and feeling nature by touching your chest with your hand and let my words act as your own for your own inner healing, acceptance, and receptivity. I acknowledge that there is a power, intelligence, and wisdom greater than my own. I am in the midst of it and it is in the midst of me, sensitive and responsive to my every thought, word, action, and feeling. I now make this true for myself by saying aloud, I acknowledge. Acknowledging this higher power working through my life I admit that I am personally responsible for solving my own problems while being guided and assisted by something greater than myself. As I am ready to surrender the conflicts of my ego to the wisdom of this infinite presence, I simply speak these words, I surrender. Knowing that forgiveness is the key to unconditional love and the feeling of heaven, I now unconditionally forgive anyone and everyone who has ever injured me in any way, real or imagined. And I now forgive myself for all of my mistaken judgments and their resulting actions. From my deepest level of understanding, I now say, I forgive. I forgive. Realizing that I continually experience the effects of my own thinking, I now choose to allow this higher power to recreate me deeply. 
filling my mind with thoughts that are only positive, constructive, loving, and beautiful. I call upon this divine inflow by stating aloud, I choose. I now center upon that one special idea that I'm willing to accept as real for me in this coming week. Visualizing that idea as already acted upon and brought to pass. In seeing my idea become a fact of my experience, I enjoy the happiness and peace of my thought fulfilled and gratefully speak these words. I accept. I accept knowing that I have an everlasting place in the midst of the power that sustains all creation as well as the support of all those around me I allow myself to relax in the peace of fulfillment and gratitude and say I release Now, in my mind's eye, I envision the presence of someone near and dear to me. This could be a friend, a family member, a teacher or mentor, someone who has touched my life in deep and loving ways. Someone who may not be physically present in the room or on this planet anymore. I turn toward that image in my mind's eye and I say, I'm grateful for the good in your life. Now I open my eyes, turn to the world around me, and joyfully speak to anyone physically present in the room or virtually on this broadcast and share in confidence and gratitude in saying, I'm grateful for the good in your lives. Well, happy Easter to you. It's Western Easter, Eastern Easter comes in five weeks. There's Eastern Easter and Western Easter because they operate off, I know that sounds funny, but I didn't mean it funny, but they operate off different calendars and it's a, it's a lunar thing. It's a lunar thing. This is why Easter is called a movable feast is because it's the first, for it, in the West, it's the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal or spring equinox. This is a lot older than Christianity, this idea. You begin to get the, the drift. This has to do with new birth and rebirth. And we're a new thought teaching and new thought. Easter is a different sort of Easter than you might have grown up with if you grew up with Easter, if you did Easter as a, as a kid. You think back to how things were in your family over the years, you know, the celebration of this time. But, well, there's some things that we've learned and, uncovered and, and well that's what I want to share with you today is about a, a new way to interpret this and what we're going to look at today and also in April and in the months to come is uh, the idea that you can have something be a metaphor, you can have something be a parable, um, you can have something even be a myth, M-Y-T-H, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's historically inaccurate. doesn't necessarily mean that this thing never happened, that it was just made up out of, as they say, whole cloth. It means that it's got layers of meaning that apply to the self in this moment. So we don't know what happened 2,000 and some years ago on a morning when a handful of people encountered an empty tomb. This is written about in the Gospels and it says something different in each of them. In fact, in Mark, I think it only gets eight lines. It says something different. And then you find out the Gospels themselves were written down 80 to 100 years later. If you think back to 80 to 100 years ago in your neighborhood, in your family, okay, with no benefit of technology to record what was going on, who said what to whom? And further, who was there to remember it? 
because it's not one of the people who are said to be on the scene who are writing this stuff down 8,200 years later. How did all of this come to be? And there's a school of thought that says, well, nobody knows exactly what happened, but by the time they got around to writing it down 80 to 100 years later, there was always, already this machinery in place called Christianity. There was already this engine of conversion that was moving up through the, the, what would be the remnants of the Roman Empire, you know. And, uh, and so they needed a backstory to justify it. They needed a story that said this man truly was the only begotten Son of God who died to liberate us from our sinful nature. And that's the story that I grew up with, and that's the story that you grew up with. Well, when I came into New Thought and I started studying New Thought, it had a different emphasis. It didn't say, it is never said to me that he didn't do that. Ernest Holmes never said he didn't do that. None of the New Thought teachers ever said this whole thing is bogus. Instead, what they said is, you know, it's worth looking at even more than the idea that Jesus died for us is the idea that Jesus lived for us. And that what he came to do was to teach us to have greater love. To have greater love. He gave himself up to the authorities. He was preaching something that was seditious, that was uh, inflammatory. The idea of equality. The idea that even the least among us, the least powerful, the least enfranchised, the people without a voice who are invisible in the world, these people mattered. These people mattered. And so he'd rather dine with them. He'd rather hang out with them. He supported them. He was not at all, uh, he did not kowtow to the authorities, to the, the powerful state. And uh, in fact, his as we talked about last week, his procession into Jerusalem was right into the heart of the empire. It was right into the middle of the seat of power, saying, here I am, and I come, I come as a prophet of God, and I come in simplicity, and I come in peace. And this was so threatening that he had to be removed from the scene because, you know, it's the same today. It's like, well, what if everybody did that? Back in the 60s, there was the saying, what if they gave a war and nobody came? What if, what if everybody just decided to, to drop their defenses and, and to love one another? How, how would it be? How would it be? And to live like that, greater love had no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends. And you know what? His friends went beyond the 12, the disciples, plus Mary Magdalene, the 13, plus his mother, plus Joseph of Arimathea, plus Simon of Cyrene, who was the person who carried his cross up to Calvary. It was more than that. We're his friends. We're his friends. All this time later, we're his greater love. He laid down his life for us to show us a couple of things. He said, this is what real love can do, because I don't have to do this. This is what Ernest Holmes pointed out, too, in a piece I think I'll read to you in a minute, if I, if I make time for it. He's, <laughs> it's all going around in my head, you know. He said that he didn't have to do this. Let this cup pass from my lips. You know, he was ready. This is a guy who raised the dead himself before he was one of them. This is a man who performed miracles. This is a man who walked on water. This is a man who manifested stuff out of thin air. You think he couldn't have swatted away a small phalanx of Roman troops? You think he couldn't have fought his way out of a scourging? You think he couldn't have come down off that cross and pretty much just incinerated everybody with a look? That kind of spiritual power, that kind of authentic power that he had? Because he didn't just have faith. He had knowing. He had embodiment that he and what he called his father or Abba were one. Were one. He knew that so completely. And this is what we seek. And this is what we strive for so he submitted himself to this awful end, purely on his own, and then said, now watch this. Now here's the thing, before I get to reading Holmes, who I think, I was going to read Holmes and then tell you what I thought of Holmes. I think I'll, I'll say me and I'll, then I'll read what he thinks of what I had to say or something like that. I don't know. 
There was a thought that kept intruding when I was putting this talk together, and I've given a lot of Easter talks because it's, well, every year, you know, and it's, there was a thought that kept coming to me, and I thought, I don't want to say that to them. That's kind of rude, but it kept coming, and so I'm going to say it, and I know we're all going to take it because it's not about you. This is not coming from me as some kind of attack on you, the viewer, or you in the room, you know. This is just something that won't let me alone. We are spiritually lazy. Humans are spiritually lazy. We're not financially lazy. We're not commercially lazy. We're not relationally lazy. We'll get up and push a vacuum around the house. We'll do pretty much any damn thing before we will take responsibility for our own spiritual station in life. We are spiritually lazy. So when I was a kid raised in a Christian household, and see if you weren't the same, and they came to me and they said, Jesus Christ died on the cross to take away all the sins of you and to grant you eternal life. My thought was, wow, thanks. That's just great. <laughs> I'm speechless. How wonderful. You've gotten between me and my choices. You've gotten between me and my consequences. You don't even know me. It brings a tear to my eye. And now I'm saved. And all I have to do, if I'm hearing this right, is believe that you actually did this. Well, I don't know. Why not? I wasn't there. And there's this book around the house, too, that says in there that you did this, you know. And, and I got nuns and priests and, you know, various and sundry other. I can even turn on the TV and they'll tell me that you did this. So why don't I believe in it? That's great. Now I got nothing I need to do. I can go right ahead on with how I was because I have punched my ticket to eternity. And that makes us spiritually lazy. And Christianity is not by far the only religion that this turns up in, where somebody has made some great sacrifice, done some great teaching, performed some great act, and, and all we got to do is bask in the glow of that. It's all been handled. If we'll just read the things and say the right words and show up at the right times and... and uh, I can't help but smile as probably you could either as you drove here this morning and you went past all these Christian churches and they're parked in the trees. They're parked and they're hanging up. They're, you know, they can't get enough to, because this is, this is the day when you get a reminder that your ticket's been punched to paradise and you're good to go, you know. And, and what happens the rest of the time? And, and they'll tell you it kind of dwindles, you know. And come around August, there's not a lot of people interested because, well, it's August and everybody's on vacation or something. I don't know. And new thought, what makes us new thought students is that we take responsibility for our own spiritual work. And what miserable life it would be to have eternal life and have anxiety fill every moment of it. Right? We're going to live forever. You know, the last thing I read that had somebody who lived forever in it that was struck, stricken with the anxiety of passing time was interview with the vampire. <laughs> right? And that series of books and these poor beings, the, the can't, they weren't human. I don't, you know, they, they, they just, they struggled along and they, and uh, uh, they watched everything change, and they had to lurk in the shadows and all of this. And it's, it's creepy and weird and un unnatural. Well, we change, you know. We have eternal life. But we don't have it on the earth. Even Jesus didn't. He came back, if you believe he came back, and he hung out a while with the disciples and stuff. But then there came the moment of ascension. And he, otherwise, he'd still be around here. There'd be this 2,000-and-something-year-old man who, you know, and the whole story would be different. But that's not how it works. And so we go through transitions. And this is the thing to have the faith about is not so much where we stand right now as what's coming tomorrow. That's why I call this to not see and yet believe, which is what Jesus said to about Thomas. He said it to the other disciples. You know, Thomas said, let me see your hands with the holes in him and, and he, he's like how, how much greater it is to not see and yet believe so what we don't see is the unknown as we've talked about incessantly here we don't see what's coming next we certainly don't see what's around the corner called physical death when we leave this earth so we have the faith we have the faith what is the thread what is the thing what is the thing that travels with us we know it's not our body we know it's not our possessions we know it's not even 
the people we love because we all move through that veil at different times, at different intervals. What is the carry through? Love, love, unconditional love. I saw a meme this week that, wow, just wow. Maybe it'll hit you the same way, I don't know. And they'll find it for you and put it up and there it'll be. It said, don't swim across an ocean. Don't swim across an ocean for people who wouldn't step over a puddle for you. Okay? And then that was crossed out with a big red X and underneath it was written, no, do it. Do it anyway. Do it anyway. No greater love. No greater love. Do it anyway. Have this force of unconditional love in your life because you will find it's the greatest gift that you have. The greatest thing that you could possibly receive is to give that love where you don't feel it's deserved. That's what makes it unconditional. That's the thing that passes through the veil. That's the thing that goes along with us is to have this, this power of love. And this is what he was teaching us from the cross. This is what he said if that record is accurate. Or even if it isn't and somebody made it up. It's a beautiful thing to make up. That he would turn in his agony. That he would turn to those on either side of him and say, today you will be with me in paradise. You know? What a, what a beautiful thought. And that we can do. And that's what we're called to do, is to have that kind of love. Is to just do that. So let me read you what Holmes wrote. And this is from... This is an obscure Ernest Holmes source. This is from Science Mind Magazine, the April 1956 issue. On Easter, we celebrate the resurrection of the great, the good, and the wise, the greatest of the great, most gentle of the compassionate, wisest of the wise, Jesus. Shall we celebrate this sublime event as something separated from our own daily lives and the prospects of our future, or shall we come at last to realize that the uniqueness of the life of Jesus lay in the fact that he didn't have to do what he did. He had an understanding of spiritual power, unlike the other martyrs of the ages, and being so wise and knowing the great need of man to answer the question that Job had put, if a man dies, shall he live again? Jesus deliberately chose a path to demonstrate the immortality, the ongoing, the evolution of everyone, not just some, if this is true as it seems to me to be, I think we should make a deep inquiry into our own minds for something that will satisfy you and me, because no one else can satisfy us. It was the teaching of Jesus that everyone is an immortal being and he didn't earn it. Rather, it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. There is no one good enough and no one wise enough in his own life, and there is no one good enough or bad enough to destroy it. Jesus said to the thief, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Today, we ought to recover the, uh, rediscover the simple teaching, which is the basis of the Christian religion. Jesus knew that when you die to this world, you instantly awake in full consciousness to the next. All right, so this is the message that it's about today. It's about this moment. We die to this world. We move on to the next, and we all think of physical death and the passing through that veil and all, but we're dying to this moment to move into the next moment that's coming, which is a function of the unknown. And to have this degree of faith that the same power travels with us, to have this understanding, as Holmes says, that we could not create our own immortality. We couldn't make this up. The greatest of the great could not invent this if it were not ours by nature, and it is ours by nature. And we are immortal now. We are mortal now. We are free now. We tend to focus a lot of times when we look at the life of Jesus on the spectacular things that he did, like the manifestations, like the healings, and all the hosannas that are sung and so on. But the simple faith that he had that everything was going to work out all right, the simple faith that he had that, that, had that the divine is within all people, that's something that we have to rediscover. And you can't find the divine effectively in other people until you find it in yourself. You see, you find it within yourself because then that's, well, now you have a heart connection. Now you have something, I don't know, there's a, there's a, a congruity, I guess you'd say, between you and the, and the rest of the world. 
So I know who I am, and so I'm going to assume you know who you are. I'm going to assume that you have the same connection with the same source, languaged in your own way, through your cultural background and your customs and so on, that I have, and it becomes all possible for us. We die to the attachment to lesser things. This is something that Emmett Fox wrote about in one of his books, and I, I, I recommend them to you, and I want to recommend to you another book while I'm thinking of it, uh, which is on the, oh, kind of the historical aspect of all of this and the, uh, from a Christian writer's viewpoint, very, very progressive and very um, intellectual uh, viewpoint, a book called The Last Week by Marcus Borg and John Dominic Cross, and a Methodist and a Catholic, uh, who take you through each day of this, of the last week of Jesus' life as recorded in the, in the Gospels with their, their take on this. But more of an esoteric nature is, is Fox's work. And he says the cross, it has four points. He says in, uh, in numerology, in sacred numerology, historical numerology of antiquity, the number four represents earth, the material plane, as in the four cardinal points of the compass, the four winds, the four corners of the earth, that kind of thing, the number four. So, so the deity sacrifices itself. The divine in you sacrifices itself on a four-pointed object. Said so this represents psychological attachment to the material realm. To be born again, you must first die to the material realm. In other words, to taking your meaning from it, to taking your meaning from temporal things, spatial things, apparent power, apparent wealth, prestige, reputation, that kind of thing. When you attach your meaning to this, you find that it's, it's built on sand. These things shift. These things change. The opinion of people, and so on. Wealth runs through your fingers. All things that are built. What is it? The, what, the uh, Rubaiyat, the writing finger, uh, the moving finger writes and having writ moves on, you know, creates civilizations that eventually evaporate. When you realize this, often in great pain, because you thought that this is where your value came from, because you were taught this by people who thought this is where their value came from, and it passes down transgenerationally. Transgener when, when you die to this idea, often in great pain, you come alive again, and you say to yourself, I am. I am that I am. I am enough just the way just the way I am. And it's from that simple place that unconditional love becomes possible because everything that looks like love before that is conditional. It's based on what can you do for me. It's based on would you step across a puddle for me to swim an ocean. It's all quid pro quo. It's all transactional. It's like how we do our money. It's like how we do our work, you know? And and that's a, that's a much lower vibration than we're talking about here, which is the ultimate, the ultimate, to know that there is one life, and that life is spirit, and that life is incarnated within all people. Now, if you're building a religion, one of the things you want to do, and Ernest Holmes never did it, which is why there aren't hundreds of millions of religious scientists on Earth. That's one of the reasons. You know, what, what he never do, did was make it exclusive. He never said religious science is the only true path. And anything else you're up to is, is, is a complete waste of your time. In fact, it's offensive to God. And uh, he didn't make a lot of rules. In fact, he made basically none, basically no rules to this, you know. And uh, so he, he completely defied what you should do in the manual of creating religion, which is say, our prophet can beat up your prophet. <laughs> Our prophet's the only one. He, and man, when they took Christian, Christianity up into, into Europe and they encountered the, the 
pre-Christian, pagan tribes, pagan meaning country people, basically. Uh, and uh, they started to tell the story. I said, you should be a Christian. I said, well, why? Well, let me tell you the story. And they told the story of Jesus. He was born of a virgin and this and this. Oh, it's interesting. You know, we know, we've heard that kind of thing before, but go on. Well, and then he, you know, and he did miracles and he, and he, wow, well, yeah, okay. Well, you want that in a God king is, you know, miracles and healings and stuff. People are sick. They need healings. And, and then he gave himself up. Then he died. Then he died and he was reborn. And they went, really? Back up a minute. He was reborn. Okay, we've heard of that too. He gave himself up. See, none of our God kings who were reborn died any other way than going down swinging in battle. Yours gave himself up. We want in. We want in. What courage that took to just say, take me. It's impressive. It's powerful. And the only thing that's a little bit truncated about it is the idea that only by believing in him are you entitled or am I entitled to the same divine estate as he enjoyed. Because God never had but one child. God had all of us. God had all of us. And in the eyes of the one, we are all one. We are all part of that. We are all equally vested in this. So the great Easter message, beyond looking back at what happened and approving of it and being grateful for it, is carrying it forward now. How will we live as what our Christian friends call Easter people? How we live as Easter people. We will do the hard work. The hard work of unconditional love as best we can. And when we fail to do it, which we will fail to do it, I promise you we will fail to do it. Before we are maybe out of this building, we will fail to do it. Who parked in my space? <laughs> Where'd my coffee go? Where, you know, no, nah, that's not who, who you are. But let's just say, it won't be with each other over that. Something will come to mind. What you got to do tomorrow, you know, something this week. Or a memory will come in, and maybe an unwelcome memory will come in, and you'll kind of feel sad or heavy or something about it, you know. So when we forget to do it, when we forget to love unconditionally, the way back into it is to love ourselves unconditionally for having forgotten to love unconditionally. You see, there's always a remedy. So be good to yourself, then, then okay, then, and then from that place, you can be better to others. And the more you do this, the easier it gets. But it never gets so easy that it doesn't require thought. It never gets so easy that it doesn't require exertion. Because otherwise we wouldn't need to have a mind. We wouldn't need to have a field of choice or do any of the, the cognitive stuff that we do. So it's a chore, it's a task, it's a calling, it's a life, it's a way of life. And that's what this teaching is, is a way of life. I invite you to join me now in knowing there is one life, there is one power, one presence, pure spirit, everywhere radiant, everywhere beautiful. And on this sweet Sunday morning, where for our Christian friends in this part of the world, it is the holiest day of the year. It is the culmination of everything. It is the reason for all faith. We extend our hearts to them in love. Those in our families who believe, leaders of every denomination, the Pope and Rome and all clergy and all teachers everywhere. We love your joy. We love your excitement. And we love your Messiah as our elder brother who went before 
and taught us how to do it. And it's been two millennia, which is on the one hand a really long time, and on the other hand, no time at all. And still we are figuring it out. But the God that made him still exists, is still there, still vibrant and active, still open and receptive. It's still who we turn to. For this knowing, for this connection, for this limitless divinity that encompasses everything, I am so deeply grateful. And I commit now to use it, to choose it, to love it, to trust it, to be with it as my companion every step of the way. Thank you, infinite, ultimate being, Mother, Father, God, that this is so, and so it is. Please either physically or mentally take your gift in your hand. And we're grateful for all that you do for us. We're grateful for everything you give us monetarily. We're grateful for your service because we can then minister to the world. And that is our job in the world. It's actually to minister people to people. It's not to be served by people. So help us get the word out. Like us on Facebook. Like us on YouTube. We really appreciate that. So now say with me, divine love through me blesses and multiplies all the good I am and have, all the good I give and receive. I am prosperous now, and so it is. Now I have a lot of other things that I want to remember too. Uh, we found the quote about not jumping oceans. So that is, I posted it up on Instagram, so if you want to read the whole thing, it's on Instagram and Facebook and in the chat. Uh, I also went and pulled the Richard, uh, not Richard Rohr, it's Thomas Merton, the quote about, I'm going to look, let's see, this is why I brought my glasses, okay, because when he was talking about not jumping oceans and, uh, or swimming oceans, our job is to love others without stopping to inquire whether or not they are worthy. This is not our business, and in fact, it is nobody's business. What we are asked to do is to love, and this love itself will render both ourselves and our neighbors worthy, which is what he said. So you do the work, and you are worthy. Okay, so that's Thomas Merton. Now, I do owe you a prayer, but I uh, have one more thing, because it's Easter. Then Easter happens to fall on March 31st, right? Well, there is one other thing. There are lots of other things going on, but there's one other thing that we want to speak to. March 31st is Transgender Visibility Day. Okay? If you didn't know, now you do. Um, and when I Googled it, because I, I Google things so that I know what I'm talking about, or at least I sound like I know what I'm talking about, there is a statement from the White House on Transgender Visibility Day. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it will be in chat. Um, I just want to read you the first paragraph. On Transgender Day of Visibility, we honor the extraordinary courage and contribution of transgender Americans and reaffirm our nation's commitment to firm, forming a more perfect union where all people are created equal and, treated, and treated equally throughout their lives. Okay, there's more to it than that. Um, <laughs> and what I want to remind you is that science of mind never had rules that they had to change. We have always been welcoming to everybody. So, happy Transgender Visibility Day. All right. I think I've gotten everything that I was supposed to do. <laughs> now I just get to pray, right? I don't know what to do with my phone or my glasses. Oh, thank God there are pockets in this dress. Oh. Because there aren't pockets in the sweater. It is a thing. It is a thing. If, you, if, you, if, if we have pockets in our dress and you admire our dress and we have pockets, that is the first thing we will say. We will put our hands in our pockets and we will say, it has pockets. 
We're very excited for pockets because a lot of our clothes don't have them. Okay, and this is why we need them, right? All right, so now I'm going to invite you to consciously enter into the sacred with me. It is always sacred all of the time. But what we are called to do, and I, I learned a new term yesterday, it is the rhythm of daily prayer. I got that out of the conviction, Courage, Conviction, and Consciousness book. The rhythm of daily prayer from the keys to prosperity. And I don't remember who the author was. But it was yesterday's reading. Um, the rhythm of daily prayer. That is where we consciously enter into the sacred, where we go to the place that nothing has ever been wrong. We go to sit with the divine. We go to marinate in the divine and to bring that magic back with us. There is one life, one power, one presence, one love. I live that life. I represent that presence. I love that love. And that power flows through me. Just as I know that it does each and every one of you. So on this holy of holiest days, when we remember that he gave up for us, we also remember that he came back. And the message was the same. Love one another as I have loved you without stopping to ask the questions. Love one another as I have loved you. It is that love that makes us worthy. It is when we give that love away in all of the amazing ways that we give that love away, starting from the simplest, which is a smile at a stranger, up to the helping hand that reaches out when we're drowning. That love is the only thing that matters. And it makes all things possible. So today, I know that love. And I know that love today and tomorrow and the day after to infinity and beyond. And I'm grateful to know that love. And I am grateful to see that love reflected back at me from each and every one of you. And I am grateful for a teaching that teaches me who I am and teaches me how to love that love. And I am grateful for this community where we love that love on each other and then carry it out to the world. And I am grateful for our ministers, our practitioners, our musicians, our amazing musicians, this technology, each and every one of you. And I relax and release with love into the law, knowing that it is done. And so it is. Say with me now, something wonderful is happening through me. Something wonderful is happening through me. I feel it in my body. I feel it in my body. I feel it in my mind. I feel it in my mind. I feel it in everything I am. I feel it in everything I am. I choose it. I choose it. I trust it. I trust it. I use it. I use it. And I love it. And I love it. So it is. So it is. Thank you.